pleasure uh, to introduce today's speaker to our uh, colloquium, Kyle Dawson, our colleague, our faculty colleague here at the, at the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And uh, of course, everyone knows Kyle, but I will. But probably not everyone knows what he's done. So I will. I <laughs> definitely want to, you know, introduce him a little bit. Kyle got his um, undergraduate degree in uh, 1998 at uh, Cornell University, so all the way in the east. And and then he moved all the way to the west, um, to the west coast, uh, to um, uh, Berkeley. And from 2000 to 2004, he worked as a graduate student researcher at um, UC Berkeley starting to work as a cosmologist at the time uh, by working on the cosmic microwave and isotropy and Sandhyayev Zeldovich <laughs> effect. Um, and it's quite interesting to learn that this exists. And it, yeah. Uh, and then he built on that uh, as a postdoc, also at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, which is right next door, um, between 2004 and 2008. Before he then, in 2009, arrived here um, at the University of Utah, was an assistant professor until 2015, for the past three years an associate professor, and he's just done an outrageous amount of work. He has, he's pursuing just scientifically so many activities. He was involved in uh, the different Sloan Digital Sky Surveys 3 and 4, working on the Baryon Oscillation Spectroscopic Survey. He has also been involved in the um, in the mid-scale dark energy spectroscopic instrument, the, um, uh, the DESI, um, and, and in, in significant roles. He was the, for, for BOSS, um, he was the survey scientist and is now still the instrument scientist on eBOSS. Um, he ha is involved in lots and lots of other scientific activities. He's a really prolific publisher with uh, more, than, uh, more than 130 papers but even more impressively, almost 20,000 citations. Uh, he has brought in really millions uh, of dollars in funding <laughs> into this department. He's a fantastic teacher. And, and this is all important, but, but <laughs> not as important as what's most important. Kyle is a fantastic colleague and a wonderful person. And so with this being said, um, I'm looking forward to learn about cosmology from the, from all the different spectroscopic surveys that he's involved in. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks for that embarrassing introduction, Christoph. Uh, so, I would first like to just note for future colloquia, it feels very weird with everyone in the very, very back row. I don't actually care, but when we have speakers coming from other institutions, we might try to vacate the back row and try to get the people a little bit closer. You know, the, 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 critic, the central mass, the center of mass is pretty far away. <laughs> so just something, I don't care, I know you all, but when we're hosting new people, we should think about it. It's easier to fall asleep uh, looking up. <laughs> I, I have fallen asleep in the front row of this symphony before. Okay. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I'm going to talk about, in general, cosmology from spectroscopic surveys. This is going to be a very different talk than the one I gave a week ago for the HEAP seminar where I have really focused on very specific things my group is doing. I'm going to talk about kind of the whole of the field, which means we're going to basically go through a lots and lots of different topics. So I'm going to start by giving just the background of cosmology, talking about uh, what are the physics of structural formation. I'm going to start very qualitative. I'm gonna, then I'm going to talk about the physical signatures we see, like how we compress the observables into statistics that we can model, and then what signatures from fundamental physics, specifically the, you know, the physics of particles and fields that we try to explore in those compressed statistics. So I'm going to talk about the different signatures we see there. Um, then I'm going to move into more of the practice of spectroscopy. I'm going to talk about the projects I work on, how we, as a community, take the data, manage the data, study the data, analyze the data, so on and so forth, uh, to get to the key results. And also kind of like what goes in the planning and what even just you know, quantifies key results. Uh, and part of that is a little bit of politics, which I'll, we'll talk about because I live in a bubble here. Not very many people, you know, most of my time I spend, I spend dealing with issues that are not in the university. Uh, and I'm just gonna let you peer into my bubble just for a little bit today. I'm not gonna bore you too much though. And then I'm going to conclude with our status of our current experiment. It's called the Extended 
baryon oscillation spectroscopic survey. Uh, we are not quite finished taking data, so I can't show final results. Uh, if I gave this talk a year from now, it would be significantly different. Okay, so I'm going to just talk about the current status of it and what we expect to accomplish by the end of 2019. So I'm going to start off by talking about the very key principles of cosmology, and that is the cosmic expansion and the growth of structure. Cosmic expansion means the fact that space itself is growing or changing with time, and growth of structure, I'll show shortly, basically highlights how matter accretes over time, how overdensities accrete more matter and grow richer, and how underdensities lose matter and grow more poorer. The classic example that we always show, I showed this in my public lecture two weeks ago, is a numerical simulation of structure formation. If you look closely, you start with a fairly homogeneous cloud. This is a density field. These are dark matter particles. And when you have overdensities, like over here, for example, they tend to pick up more and more material and grow more and more overdense. We have a very specific model for this. The model predicts how much this overdensity grows as a function of time. Okay. This is a numerical simulation. We do have analytic approximations, which I'll discuss shortly. The analytic approximations are very good. Now, when we actually go out and take the data, we can't see that that was almost 14, that was about 14 billion years of cosmic evolution. You know, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. It was almost all the universe's history we just saw. You can't see all that with observation, of course. What you do instead is you get snapshots at a given epoch of cosmic history. And basically, the further out you look, the earlier in cosmic history you're exploring. So here is a snapshot of the universe as it looks today. This is a very local. Again, this is the same simulation. But what you see is that on very, very large scales, you know, this is 3 billion light years across. You really don't see much structure. Things look pretty homogeneous. But as you zoom in, you start seeing those same structures forming this web-like pattern. It almost looks like a sponge, right? You see voids, you see overdensities, you see things that look like a galaxy cluster, you see veins or filaments, and we can characterize all this with two-point or three-point statistics. And as you zoom in, you see significant, significant detail, and the key point which you see here is when you're on these scales now, like tens of megaparsecs, Basically, two points of statistics are no longer sufficient to characterize all the information, and you need additional measurements, or additional ways of characterizing the data. And I'll only hint at that throughout the talk, but this gives you an idea of what structure looks like. What I've talked about so far is just dense and overdense regions, but if you actually look closely at that first simulation, you note there's another, phys uh, another uh, uh, observable at play. Not just are you seeing dense and overdense regions, you're actually seeing structures moving. So if I zoom in, if I just look closely, right now it's hard to see the velocities because it's at early times. They haven't had enough time to pick up velocities as they fall into their potential wells. But as you start looking, you actually see later and later times these dark matter particles, you can literally see them moving. Okay? There is a lot of physical information encoded in those velocities as well. That's the velocity field. And that information couples the velocities of particles to the gravitational wells, and it gives you some measure of what general relativity is doing over all of cosmic history. Okay, so that's another observable we see in our cosmological surveys. And I'm going to talk about that as well. So that's the, the, the qualitative background of what we do. We want to basically measure those structures over as much of cosmic history as possible and unravel the physics that lead to the growth of structure that we see. Okay? So let's think about how we quantify that in more mathematical terms, and what features we look for due to different physical processes look like in the statistics. Okay. So underlying all the simulations, they are done in a co-moving frame. So we take out, at least illustratively, the cosmic expansion history. Uh, but underlying that is the fact that the universe is expanding with time. We characterize that with what's called the Friedman equation. The Friedman equation basically gives you an equation of motion over all time. It tells you how much, what's the, basically what's the velocity between two coordinates in the sky, in space, as a function of the age of the history of the universe, or the age of the universe. Okay. Now, if I look at the mathematics, on the left-hand side, 
This is just a constant that's a, a proportionality, basically. That's the local expansion rate. That's called the Hubble constant. It's about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So what that means, if I look at two points that are separated by one megaparsec today, they're moving away from each other due to cosmic expansion at a rate of about 70 kilometers per second. I'll come back to that at the end because we actually see some controversy in that, which is one of the more interesting uh, things that we're seeing in our, in our, our surveys. On the numerator of that left-hand side is not h not today, but h at any point in cosmic time. So that's, that's a, now we have something as a function of time. And again, it's the same units. Here we characterize what's the universe made out of. Here's a radiation term. Here's a matter term. Here's a curvature term. And here's what we call a dark energy term. This radiation term is a very, very well understood. We have a, a, a very specific measurement of the radiation density today because we can measure the temperature of the cosmic micro background. It's a black body, it's 2.73 Kelvin, and we know how many photons there are per cubic centimeter from that measurement. Okay. You know that in the denominator, you talk about, you present how that is diluted with cosmic expansion. The radiation term is diluted by a factor of a to the fourth. a is the scale factor, and what that means is that you lose, your, your particles get diluted as according to volume, that would be a cubed, plus an initial term due to redshifting. You lose energy per photon. So that's a very fast uh, decrease with cosmic time. That means that this radiation term is less and less significant at later times. Here, you have the matter term. It just gets diluted as a function of volume. As the volume grows, it goes proportional to volume. Curvature, uh, I'm just going to present in this slide for now and not come back to it. But it tells you about what's the fundamental uh, shape of the universe. Like, what's the fundamental geometry? If I draw a triangle, to the, the, the size of the triangle add up to be 180 degrees. It's a way of characterizing that question. Okay. Here is the omega lambda term. I've generalized it in a, in a term of dark energy. If you see, there's a unit in the numerator which tells you how much there is today. What's the energy density today? And the denominator, you see, a, uh, a function of scale, right? The scale factor is A that tells you what's the average separation between two points. Uh, and then you have something that we don't understand is how it behaves over cosmic time. That's why, that's how we parameterize the numerator of that term, okay? That's a question in cosmology. If this is a cosmological constant, okay, the simplest form, that just tells me at all points in time, I have the same energy density per unit volume due to this term. We don't understand where this term came from. The underlying physics break down if you try to measure it from a particle physics perspective or fields that we think we understand. Uh, so we keep it really general and we leave these as free parameters. Okay, so these free parameters allow me to characterize it today. That's what W naught is. And the evolution with redshift, which is this uh, W A component. Okay. So that's kind of a summary of how we characterize the expansionist of the universe. If I can measure H at many, many different epochs, I can pull out all these individual terms and solve for W naught and W A. So that's one of the key goals of cosmology. Make as many measurements on the left-hand side as possible and deduce what belongs on the right-hand side. Today, okay, so this is a really, really good question. I'm actually going to answer that in, uh, in a couple slides, but the question is which dominates the expansion history? In the first 100,000 years of the universe, this term dominates, the radiation term. So basically, we live in a universe that's all photons and neutrinos, actually. Okay, from about 100,000 years to like 5 billion years ago, you know, for about 9 billion years, something like that, this term dominates, the matter. Now, today, from all, all we can see, this term is dominating. So it really means if you look out in the universe today, in, in a cubic meter of space, you have roughly the equivalent of one proton of energy from this term, from the matter term. They're not protons, but that's about how much energy there is in one cubic meter. And you have about four protons of energy from that term. So give me kind of the idea of the scaling today. So it's kind of weird, it's, it's you know, something like 70% is the, the real number on omega lambda today. But it evolves at all. Every point in cosmic history has a different solution to that, that question. Okay. So a key thing is that Friedman equation comes out of a derivation of general relativity applied to a, a fully isotropic and homogeneous universe. And that math comes out uh, cleanly. But the universe is not homogeneous. It's not isotropic. 
Well, it's isotropic, but it's not homogeneous. And we can see that by the fact that we exist here today. We are not uh, 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 a, a part of a uniform density of one particle per cubic meter. Okay? We can't even produce a vacuum of that, of that uh, low a density on the Earth. So why is that? And the principle of inflation is what gives us the structure we see today. That's what seeds all the structure. And it really is the fact that if you look on quantum scales, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle tells me that our fundamental assumption in deriving the Friedman equation is wrong. There's no such thing as perfect homogeneity. You know, there's quantum fluctuations, and they, they in, in, on a quantum level, they, are, they don't imprint any real information because they come and go, let's say. But this period of inflation, which lasts about 10 to the minus 34 seconds, this is a really key component of our cosmological model. It has to happen. It's for 10 to the minus 34 seconds, the universe basically expands by 60 E foldings. So it's an, almost an instantaneous just explosion of everything. And what that does is all those quantum fluctuations that were there due to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle get enhanced to macroscopic scales and thus frozen. They get locked in. And once you have those quantum fluctuations, you now have what look like hot spots and cold spots in the matter density field. They are allowed to grow with time under the force of gravity. So we start by at the time that inflation ends, we characterize the fluctuations. And this is actually true at all points in time, I should say. We characterize the fluctuations by this density field. The density field is defined by the average, you know, the difference at any coordinate, r and t in, t in time, from the average, scaled by the average. So it's basically the fractional under density or over density. If you have a point in space that's exactly equal to the average, it's equal to zero in delta, the, the, the over density is zero. If it's a little bit under dense, it's negative. If it's over dense, it's positive. Okay? So this is a key, uh, a key issue for, for solving the growth of structure. And once I have an over dense region, right, anything that's positively, that has more material than its surroundings, it's going to collapse under the influence of gravity. Okay? And that's where we come from. Now, we have the Friedman equation that describes the expansion history of the universe. I can solve this, as Andre asked, at different phases in time, whether or not, with a very simple solution. I have an A dot term here, and I can have something, if I'm dominated by radiation, I can go as a day of the fourth, day of the third, day of the second, depending on what component is dominating. So analytically, this is solvable. And then numerically, it's solvable at any time when you get hybrids of these, uh, uh, you get different combinations of the, com the components. Okay? What comes out is the solution of the derivative of A relative to A. So it's the fractional change in the velocity relative to the scale factor. Okay? Now, that's what we call the Hubble parameter. And that tells me how fast the universe is expanding at a given time. That expansion acts as a drag against the collapse we saw in those early simulations. Right? As if I have an overdense region, it wants to collapse and collapse and build more material, build more material. But it's doing so as the average separation between particles is increasing. So this term, this Hubble parameter, decreases the rate at which structure grows. And we have a formula that describes that. This is called the growth equation. The growth equation looks very familiar. If you ignore the drag term, you have a second derivative that's proportional to a gravitational potential, right? So delta, the second derivative, is proportional to the density. And that just looks like the formula for gravity, right? The sec the F, F equals ma. Okay. Here, a, you know, again, the, the drag term reduces the rate at which structure grows. And we can solve this equation in different regimes, if you're matter-dominated, radiation-dominated, or lambda-dominated. And these are the solutions for those three regimes. If you look at the bottom solution, if we're in a universe that is dominated by the cosmological constant, structure cannot grow. Okay? So that's kind of an interesting stage. That's where we are today. So th this, this approximation holds true as long as deltas are small, as long as deltas are less than one. So once you, we're basically at a time where you no longer will see uh, large scale structures collapse into, into stuff like galaxies. This is for a, a lambda being a constant. So w equals minus 1 for all time. And w equals 0. That's right. This be, that's, that's not solvable for more complex. Okay. Okay. 
So we have an equation that describes the expansion of the universe. The components, are, you know, what goes into that are the components of the universe, uh, and, you know, matter, radiation, so on and so forth. We have a solution for the growth of structure. Because there's an H in here, it also consists of the cosmological model, like what is the, the matter, radi matter component, what's the radiation component, what's the lambda component. So we now have two equations that we want to solve for. And if we can measure the terms associated with each of these, we can start getting understanding of what makes up the universe. That what we have to do is, if I look at a growth at a single lower density, that's what's described here, I have to then take that and you know, imprint it on the whole density field and characterize it. Okay. So mathematically, that's pretty simply done. If I look at the, the solution Fourier space, the Fourier modes evolve in exactly the same way as the, the, the real space modes. Okay. I can also quantify it as a correlation function, which is basically just a pair counting exercise. If I have an object here, what's the likelihood that I find another object here? If I have an object or density here, what's more like, what's likely I have another density here? And that's represented mathematically by a standard correlation function. And both of these statistics, the Fourier, the Fourier space realization and the real space realization are ways we characterize the matter distribution we showed in those early slides. Okay. So that's now the background. Everything describes in that, in that mathematical formulation describes the underlying matter density field, the, all those deltas. And we have the solutions for those as long as delta is small. Okay. But delta is you know, dark matter particles primarily, they're not observable. You can't see them directly. So you have to see some other tracer of those particles. What we use is spectroscopy or imaging or CMB data to, as a proxy to, to capture or to capture other observable objects or galaxies as a proxy for that underlying density field. For my field is spectroscopy. And what we do is we take images of the sky, get a spectrum of each object, and then make a three-dimensional atlas of, that, of the universe using the galaxies, where those galaxies each serve as a biased tracer of the underlying density field. And as I discussed before, with the correlation function and the power spectrum, we then collapse our distribution of galaxies into a two-point statistic, and then we look for the, the signatures of physics in that two-point statistic. So what are we looking for now? We can look at pairs of galaxies and count the probability of finding one galaxy as a function of distance from another galaxy. In, encoded in that distribution are, the way I see it, like four different physical questions and, and particles and fields. The first is the physics of inflation. F inflation is what I presented a few slides ago, which imprint the fluctuations that we see that evolve into the structure today. That's basically setting the initial conditions of the density field. And that's so once you have the initial conditions, they exist through the, the two points of through all of time. You just have to be able to disentangle it from everything that's happened since then. Okay. Additionally, there's the cosmic distance scale or expansion history. That's the Friedman equation. So we can find observables in our two points of statistics over all time and, and start and use that to constrain the Friedman equation. There's tests of general relativity built into our model, both for the expansion, you know, the expansion rate and the growth of structure is the model of general relativity. We can test that and see if it's accurate. And lastly, the masses of neutrinos show up as a very specific and distinct signature in the clustering of matter. Okay. Okay. So I started off that. The sum of the masses, I'll talk about it shortly. So the differences in masses can be constrained with oscillation experiments, but they don't give you an absolute mass. We can get, we have the best measurements of the absolute masses. And I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. When you consider the free modes, you have to assume that the spatial geometry is flat? No, they show up. Yeah, so so uh, you do not have to assume the spatial geometry is flat. Um, if, Uh, I see what you're, so in terms of solving this, so the answer is no, because the, the geometry of the universe is going to be encoded in this a dot over a term. 
So you actually are encoding the, whether or not the universe is flat, open, or closed in the drag, sorry, uh, in the drag factor right here. Okay, so when I said this is the drag, this, right, this is the, whether or not the universe is flat, open, or closed right here, this goes into my solution for the A dot over A term. So it actually does affect the expansion rate. Any, any other questions? That's basically the background of the physics, or the very high level cosmology physics. All right, so I, on the last slide, I start off by saying, look, we want to measure the matter density field, and we can understand all these things about the universe. But we can't observe the matter density field. So what do we see instead? We see galaxies, we see quasars. Those are two of the primary things we can observe outside of the Milky Way. They come in two flavors. So galaxies and quasars, when we observe them spectroscopically, they can serve as like beacons, right? Point-like beacons on the matter density field. And you can measure the two point statistics between one point here and one point here, and one point here and one point here. And each object, if you have a three-dimensional location of it, gives you that, you know, that beacon. In the EBOS program, we can see how we explore the look back time of the universe as a function of tracer with direct point you know, direct point-like tracers. Here in the yellow, we can use galaxies to explore cosmic history back to about six or seven billion years ago. And here in red, we use quasars because they're the most luminous objects in the universe to expand, to ex explore uh, distances further out, further back in time. So roughly speaking, six to 11 billion years ago. Okay, so those are kind of the epics we can explore by looking at one object at a time and making a three-dimensional map. There's another technique, which is the, called the Lyman Alpha Forest. Uh, I talked about this a little bit last week in my HEAP seminar. And the idea here is we now don't have point-like tracers, but we have a uh, tracers of the continuous density field, which is closer in some ways to what we actually want to measure. But there's a lot of things that make this complicated. So here you have an observer sitting over here, looking out into space at a very, very, very distant quasar. And as light travels from that quasar to the observer, you see silhouettes imprinted into the spectrum of the quasar due to absorption along the, the, the path to your eyeball. So what happens is all the neutral hydrogen in the universe, when the photon travels from the quasar to your eyeball, if it gets, it gets redshifted along the way, and when it hits that 1216 transition, which is the energy it takes to transition an electron from the n equals one state to the n equals two state in hydrogen, it gets absorbed and we lose information and we fundamentally see how we're losing information over all of space by making a three-dimensional map of these quasars and the skewers to each quasar with the, the, the measure of the, the absorption field along that skewer. Okay, so those are the two techniques. Uh, in neither case are we measuring the direct density field, but we're getting some proxy for it. And what we want to do is build an experiment that can go out and basically measure these dots over here or measure these fluctuations over here, this continuous field over here. Okay. The first step in such an experiment is to look with, your eye, you know, look with pictures of the sky in color, basically, and identify what objects look like they'd be good ways of measuring that density field with the spectrum. So you go and you build an algorithm and to choose one object or another to put a fiber on and measure a spectrum of. It's, you can't measure all of them. You have to, we can measure something like, over the last 10 years, we've read about 3 million out of a catalog of billions, you know, which eventually the, you know, the LSOC catalog will be about 5 billion galaxies. So there's some thought that goes into selecting objects to make your three-dimensional map. And I'll, I'll talk about that as we get to the experimental design. So now we have a physics explained with the Friedman equation and with the growth of structure. It describes the density field. We have tracers of that density field. We can compress them into a power spectrum or a correlation function. What are the observables we're actually looking for? So the first observable is observables associated with inflation. So how do we characterize that? So the inflation is what imprints the initial fluctuations in the density field. They are really, for me, they, I don't know the physics, no one knows the physics of inflation. If you're looking at growth of structure, it really is just setting the initial conditions. And we characterize those initial conditions 
basically with several different simple metrics. The first is if I look at the power spectrum, this on very, very large scales, you see this is, okay, so on this x-axis is wave number, so it's one over distance, basically. This is a scale of about 100 megaparsec. This is a scale of about a gigaparsec. This is several gigaparsec over here. If you look in the region from several gigaparsec to 100 megaparsec, you see very, very boring predictions from the cosmological model. Very, just a pure linear trend in the power spectrum. That is the initial conditions for inflation. We characterize that according to a power law, where the power spectrum is proportional to the wave number to some power. Inflationary models predict that number n should be a little less than 1, and it is. Measuring from the CMB, it's about you know, 0.968 measured at high significance to be different from 1. Okay, so we measure the slope of this curve. That's primarily coming from the CMB, but we can do better with galaxy surface as well. We just haven't figured out how to do it yet. Okay. Now, other models for inflation predict that that's not a pure linear a pure power law, but it actually should break and evolve. There should be a change in the term uh, n as a function of wave number. So we take the derivative of that, treat that as another parameter of cosmological model. The CMB again gives us the best constraints on that. No one is measuring anything to be non-consistent with zero, but we believe it should have a signal non-consistent with zero. And again, right now CMB dominates these, but we have the data to, to do better. Those, the power spectrum and the observables for inflation appear in the, the power spectrum under the simplest models, but they're assuming all the information is encoded in a two-point statistic. So there's other models where we expect there to be uh, non-Gaussian fluctuations from, resulting from inflation, and then you need higher order statistics to characterize those. Things like a, like a, a three-point function or, or a bispectrum. And again, the best constraints to, to ask the question about whether or not Gaussian is sufficient to describe the power spectrum or describe clustering if they come from the CMB, and there's no evidence that there's anything beyond uh, Gaussian signal. And then the last signature that appears is the tensor to scalar ratio, which is not possible with optical surveys. Uh, but the first three observables are present in our data if we can find them. Okay. The next observable is the cosmic distance scale. Okay. When I was interviewing here many years ago, I was a supernova cosmologist. And it's very simple to explain the cosmic distance scale. You have an object that explodes, you know how bright it is, and you can judge how far away it is by how bright it appears to your eye. That's the concept of a standard candle, and type 1a supernova were an excellent standard candle. They are an excellent standard candle. Okay? But there's other standard measures that we can use to get distances. If we can get distances as a function of time, or distances as a function of redshift, we can constrain the Friedman equation and, and pull out all those terms we care about. Another way to look at this is instead of looking at how bright is the candle, you can ask how tall is the candle. If you know exactly the height of it, you can deduce its distance by its angular extent on the sky. And that's called not a standard candle, it's called a standard ruler. And we have a standard ruler in our cosmological redshift surveys. We've seen this in talks before, that ruler is the baryon acoustic oscillation feature. It drives the name of all of our experiments right now. And the idea here is that at very early times, if you have any overdensity, uh, the baryons and the photons are coupled to each other and you get sound waves. And the sound waves propagate for a finite amount of time until they're unable to travel because the photons decouple from the baryons. And that's the, at that point, you get a picture of the CMB. And we see a lot of physics from the cosmic background. But the sound wave grows during that, that time up to about 300,000 years after the Big Bang. And then the photons stream out from the baryons, and it's frozen for all of cosmic history. Okay. We know the physics of the early universe pretty well, although, again, I'll come back to that at the end of this talk. There's, there's reason for, to question that statement. But under the best models, this standard ruler has a radius of 150 megaparsecs, so roughly 500 million light years. That's in today's units. So if I can find this feature in the clustering galaxies, I can make precise measurements of distance. And this is kind of a, a, this is an artistic rendition of such. If I have a galaxy here, there is 
a higher probability at 150 megaparsec of finding another galaxy than there is at distances plus or minus. Right? So you basically get a surplus of probability of finding objects separated by 150 megaparsec. But I have to go out and survey the whole universe, and it's not as simple as looking at this. Uh, it's a very, very, very faint signal. And we use spectroscopic surveys to make that measurement. To give you an idea of the scale of that feature, here's imaging from the early Sloan survey. This is the size of that BAO feature. It has a radial component that's directed along the line of sight, and has a transverse component perpendicular. If I'm trying to measure this, if I don't see that specifically in the distribution of galaxies. It's imprinted very, very deep in the statistical distribution. And it's also, you need to have a huge volume to get any number of independent measurements of this feature. So that's kind of the game. Spectroscopy gives us the three-dimensionally resolved map and allows us to constrain it. If I try to do so with photometric data, right, I no longer have a precise three-dimensional location, which is the radial. But you can actually get measures of it from this over a large volume, which is amazing. So we really understand this pretty well, and we can find it in photometric surveys. Okay. So another observable is general relativity. Okay. Remember when we showed the simulations, you could see the density field, but you can also see particles moving around the density field. Basically, we can characterize that velo those velocities with spectroscopy. The technique is called retrospace distor distortions. And the idea is if I'm, looking, if I'm looking out this way, if an object's moving perpendicular to my line of sight, I can't see the velocity. But if an object's moving along the line of sight in this direction, that velocity is, is degenerate with the Hubble expansion. So it imprints some additional feature on top of the Hubble expansion rate. So I can actually see distortion introduced because of those velocities along the site because I get Doppler shifting. And Doppler shifting looks a lot like Hubble expansion. So I get a squashing of uh, what would otherwise be round circular features. They may be round in real space, but what I observe to be a squash because of bulk flows along the line of site. And that's a direct observable. And it's actually, be, we haven't yet perfected it, in our last experiment that, you know, that we re released the results in 2017, we measured this to about 8% precision, but the statistical power is you know, four or five times better than that in the data. We just, the modeling is a limitation at this point. Okay. The last thing we can see in the clustering of matter or in the clustering of galaxies is the absolute mass of neutrinos. So the idea here is that when neutrinos are propagating, they propagate in, in not as species like electron neutrino, uh, muon neutrino, but as mass eigenstates. They have specific masses. If I measure the oscillations between flavors, I can get constraints on the difference in mass between the mass eigenstates, but I can't get absolute measurements of mass. If I look at the lowest case scenario, I say the first mass eigenstate has zero mass, and I use the oscillation data, to guess what's the sum of all three masses, it's about 50 milli electron volts. So it's the lowest mass the three eigenstates in combination can have based on oscillation experiments. We can find, due to the fact that the, the neutrinos affect both the expansion history and the growth of structure, because they change their behavior over cosmic time. At early times, they have a very high energy and are relativistic, but because they have mass, they transition to a non-relativistic state, and that shows up in the Freeman equations. They go from an omega radiation term to an omega matter term, and we can model that. They also stream out of, of local structures because their velocities aren't zero, but they're higher. They're higher than the, the, the escape velocity, basically, of structures. Uh, and they free stream out and suppress structure formation in a scale-dependent way. We can also see that. And that is a subtle thing that's in the RSD measurements. But at the end of the day, when I look at all that we've done, the lower bound from oscillations is 50 milli electron volts. The upper bound at 95% confidence from our measurements is 160 milli electron volts. So we're really closing the window on constraining the, the mass of neutrinos. We can't tell one flavor from another or one eigenstate from another, but we have very good sensitivity to the sum of the masses. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so to remind everyone, I have a lot of slides left, but uh, 
we can measure inflation, cosmic distance scales, GR, and neutrino masses in the distribution of matter. So how do we do that? My technique is spectroscopic surveys. I basically play four roles in my time here in, in spectroscopic surveys. Uh, as Christoph mentioned, I, was, I, I started in the BOSS experiment. That ran for five years. The collaboration has about 150 people in it. And I was a title called the survey scientist, which really doesn't mean very much. In practice, it kind of meant I was like the sidekick of the PI. Okay? I didn't really know what I was doing, but I learned how, how to run a project and what really mattered. Uh, the current project, which uses the same instrument on the same telescope, is called EBOSS. That's a, also a five-year project of comparable size, about 150 people. I'm actually the, the principal investigator and the lead scientist for that project now. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, to, just to, again, because that's my bubble, and I'm going to give you some insight into my bubble. The next project, if you see, we're trying to build up a period over 15 years, spectroscopic surveys to the penultimate, which is the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument, DESI. That will conclude in 2025. We're in the process of building it. Uh, a lot of my time right now is thinking about the construction of this. And the last thing I do is there's a small group of us in the US community that basically act as a liaison between the agencies and the, and the whole cosmology community to try to figure out how to best implement the resources we have to, to get the most out of the science from large surveys. And I'll, I'm not going to talk. I'll give one slide on DESI. I'll give one slide on Cosmic Visions. Uh, but this is you know, a, a, a promotion review, so I feel like I should at least mention it. What I'm really going to focus my talk on is EBOS. Okay. So DESI is a large spectroscopic survey. It's going to start next year. If I was giving this talk in the fall, this is all I would talk about. Uh, it's in Arizona. It's, it's very close to being ready to commission. The Cosmic Visions group, there's, about, there's eight of us. Uh, the names are right here. Uh, we basically try to work with the program officers in the Department of Energy to prioritize new things you can do at small scales or you know, figure out how to plan for the decadal survey or the next, the next 10 years. There's a lot of different things we do not very efficiently. Um, this is, for example, something we did in January, proposing about $15 million of work to do to enhance LSST and DESI uh, across the whole community, across the whole United States. Like, What can the Department of Energy do to make these experiments better with just about $15 million? And this is like this ongoing negotiation to figure out how to implement this. One day they say they want a one-page summary. The next day they say they want a 150-page summary. And, and no one knows what, what they want. But that's, that's a fair amount of time. Uh, EBOS is the experiment we're running right now. And the idea here is to explore the region of the universe that we missed in BOSS. BOSS ran for five years. We observed galaxies out about 7 billion years in the, into the past. And we observed with quasars, the Lyman Alpha Forest, you know, something like 10 to 12 billion years in the past. But we missed the intermediate range. So EBOS, the idea, is to use the Apache Point Observatory with these aluminum plates and optical spectrographs to fill in the three-dimensional map in this redshift range. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show that. But qu the primary thing that gets us from here to here are quasars. Uh, quasars, we hypothetically could observe them in BOSS, but we didn't have a good enough sample to select them. Um, I'm only going to show, uh, the, we actually spend, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a few sentences. We spend years and years talk, trying to answer that question. Um, the observatory looks like this. There's a few other telescopes. This is the Apache Point, the 2.5 meter Sloan telescope. It's got a very unique signature that many of you may recognize. I'll come back to this several times over, but really this is the most capable experiment in the world for doing spectroscopic cosmology. There really is without peer. Okay. So let's see how we make these projects happen. Andre asked me, what do we select for targets? Okay, so basically, if you look at these years, the project started in 2014, we spent 2013 to 2015 trying to answer that question. We built up from imaging data tests of galaxies that can sample one redshift range, another type of galaxy to sample another redshift range, quasars from new imaging data, and we had to go through the whole process of trying to make all these selections from optical imaging work 
to make sure we get spectroscopy. And it was very iterative. Uh, I, you, know, you can see the authors were not me, but I had to spend a lot of my time, because you know, I'm kind of the glue in the project. I spent a lot of my time with each of these phases trying to make sure it really gelled with our design for the, for the experiment. And this was, like, this was about two years of effort to come down to, to, to write those out. Other things we had to think about, you know, I did not participate in the imaging part, actually. This was completely left to others. But how you take targets and design them for spectroscopy was a lot of work. We had to rewrite the code. So he Zhang, so Jeremy uh, wrote the code to get them ready so we could get them, all, you know, all the targets together in one file and, and figure out how to, to characterize them and sort them. He Zhang is a professor at Ohio. She wrote the code to then take fibers and put them on those targets in the most effective way possible. I spent two years writing pseudocode, testing it with Jeremy and Hijang. Uh, mountain operations, my last postdoc was Vivek. Uh, he oversaw all the uh, you know, operations of the mountain, make sure the observers were doing the right thing, make sure the instrument was calibrated. I also worked a lot with him on that, making sure we had all the routines to efficiently get the system running. Uh, Julian was my last postdoc. Uh, he works with um, our colleagues Stephen and Julian on calibrating the data reduction, you know, the data that comes out of the instrument, you know, making sure it's processed in a way that can be used for science. That's years and years of effort. Uh, it's everything with, you know, you're in the low signal noise regime with millions of spectra, so you're really trying to fine tune everything to make sure you get the most out of the data without totally screwing it up. And we've screwed it up a lot. We actually had introduced a mistake that took us three years to resolve uh, because we changed the way we, we changed Gaussian weighting, which seems totally harmless, and it wreaked havoc on us. So really nuanced things can happen here. You have to understand how, how your interpretation of the data affects the science, uh, how you model the spectra. Uh, my last graduate student, Tim, left to, he finished a year ago. Uh, he set up the new pipeline for galaxies. Elion has improved all of this. Uh, he's sitting uh, right back here. He's improved all of this for the survey for galaxies and quasars. Uh, we also work with Stephen and Brad in Wyoming. Uh, Isabel Peretz at one point was working on this. And then this is now finalized. My attention in the last year has now been moving towards making sure the clustering uh, is being documented correctly and tracked correctly. I work with Rita and St. Andrews and Ashley in Ohio State and some others to make sure that all that happens. We had a workshop here in July. Okay. So that's survey infrastructure. You also have to make sure the science is in place. Again, being the glue in the survey, I've got to follow all the working groups. We have five groups to, to, to help work out the science for 150 people. Okay? The first is focused on cosmology from quasars and galaxies. The second is Lyman Alpha Forest. We run numerical simulations and mock catalogs. We try to actually sometimes look at the spectra themselves, understand about galaxies, and sometimes we try to learn about quasars. So I have to work with these groups to make sure everything, everyone's understanding the data correctly, and we have a path forward to getting the final results out that we're promising. Uh, also, I have to choose the people who lead each of these working groups out of the 150 people. That actually is a very easy task. And also, like as an example, yesterday we decided to dissolve this working group. So it's always, there's always things in flux. And these are things I have to worry about day to day. Okay, the last thing is more on the politics side. We are a telescope, we're kind of astronomers, but we're studying particles fields, so we're kind of high energy physicists. We kind of fall in this kind of murky middle, um, but it's moving more and more towards the high energy physics regime. So I have to really conform to the demands from, from that community. So every 10 years, the community gets together and lays out the priorities for all major experiments to be built. The process is called the, the Particle Physics Project Prioritization Panel, and it's a lot of work. Uh, they have a summary from 2013 that came out that lists what are the fundamental things that the high energy physics community wants to get out of experiments. These are the five high priority items. These are the science drivers. As a spectroscopic cosmologist, as I've showed earlier, we have to defend ourselves and explain that we're here to measure cosmic acceleration, both in dark energy and inflation, and we're here to understand neutrinos. Okay. And again, the techniques, as I mentioned before, are with distance measurements, uh, redshift space distortions, and then large-scale measurements to get inflation and neutrino masses. Okay. 
So a lot of my time earlier in this year was yet again going through and defending all the, the entire project. I don't ever get, I'm under a microscope as the leader of the project, but no one in the agencies care about what I do as an individual. So I always have to explain the project as a whole. So in February, we got reviewed uh, along with all the experiments in the high energy physics program in DOE. There's 13 of them. And the idea was to figure out how to prioritize the resources in these experiments for the next few years. Okay. We got judged on things like the impact on the P5 science drivers and how efficiently we were running. I did talk about what everyone, all 150 scientists were doing. I had to count them. A lot of it was a pain in the ass. We, we reviewed among all the 13 non-collider experiments. So the, the ATLAS and CDMS there is just considered a separate entity. Uh, if you look at the non-collider, you basically fall into two categories. The intensity frontier, which is primarily neutrinos, and the cosmic frontier, which is, part of, which is um, things that come from outer space. Uh, in our case, uh, we fall in the cosmic frontier category, and there's really only two cosmology experiments running in this portfolio right now. It's us and a project called the Dark Energy Survey. You can also see other things like AMS, many people know about. They're looking for positron electron asymmetries. They're on the space station. Fermi Lat is another space telescope. Hawk is a ground based telescope that, of course, people here are working on. Okay. At the end of the day, uh, we got reviewed extraordinarily well. Of the 13 experiments, if you really look at the, you know, at, at the, at the words, uh, we really were ranked the first out of all 13. Uh, there was more superlatives, uh, more positive responses from program officers, from the reviewers. Uh, we did extremely well. The panel, though, didn't want to do anything beyond a grouping of four tiers. And you see cosmology, both from EBOS, uh, from EBOS and DES, we both ranked in the top tier. And again, as I said, I really think that we were number one out of 13. So just to put it into context for uh, for the high energy physics portfolio, we're only going to get better as we move forward to DESI. Okay. Okay. So I have five minutes left. I'm just going to go really quickly through where we are in EBOS. We really are the lead project in making distance measurements, really even including supernova at this point. If you look at the cosmological model, it's really just BOSS, EBOS, and the CMB driving it these days. BOSS, as I mentioned before, covers redshift regimes EBOS, that are either high redshift or low redshift, and we're doing the in-between with EBOS. We're only about halfway through the analysis. We have a two-year sample that we completed. Uh, we have released many results from that two-year sample, uh, including some of the key science measurements. Uh, we have about 10 papers that are sitting in some form of draft at the moment. Uh, they should be ready soon. And this constitutes the last observations for cosmology that will ever be made from the Apache Point Observatory, or from the Sloan, tele cosmology, the Sloan program. Okay. So we've completed one of our programs already, and then everything, our last photon will arrive on February 15th, and that's when we shut down. Okay. The measurements Basically, I'm going to show all the measurements on the cosmic distance ladder from these projects. First, starting in BOSS. This gives you an idea of the data quality. This is the correlation function on galaxies measured from BOSS at the highest redshift bin, a medium redshift bin, and the lowest redshift bin. That bump at 100 megaparsec is what we're trying to model. That gives us a very precise measurement of this distance scale. These are basically give me measurements of the distance scale about one, and a half, one to one and a half percent precision. Okay. We released this as a collaboration-wide you know, alphabetical paper that came out in 2017, that came out last year. Um, at the higher redshift, we used the Lyman Alpha Forest. My former postdoc, Julian, finished a measurement on the autocorrelation in Lyman Alpha Forest. We published that in 2017. And my current postdoc, Elion, for his thesis project, wrote the paper for the, the cross-correlation between Lyman Alpha Forest and quasars. Here, you see a lot more interesting structures. It's a much more complicated measurement due to the fact that you're measuring everything in your spectrum rather than a single point. But at the end of the day, the physics is still the same, and we can still isolate the exact same baryon acoustic oscillation feature and make measurements at the 2% precision level. Okay. And 
here we have alphabetical, here we have basically my group providing half of the measurements on the distance scale. It was very, very hard to make those measurements in EBOS because we really pushed the limits of what the telescope was capable of doing, probably against better judgment. Um, it, for the, when we first started taking data, this is what it looks like. Here in black is the data. And we have to model 100 million, or sorry, 100, um, 100,000 of these galaxy spectra in the first two years. And the model is the blue. And we really have to model it sufficiently that you can get a precise redshift estimate. And when we tried using the old pipeline, it, everything failed. It was not a sufficient, complete, we couldn't sufficiently do it to the point that we thought we couldn't even make the distance measurements. We couldn't actually measure the clustering signal. So many people in the working groups bailed on the project, on that part of the project. So we, here, my group, primarily through Tim, uh, who was my graduate student at the time, rebuilt the data reduction pipeline to refine the modeling of this. And just to give you an idea of what we're trying to pull out, like this is, a, this is the primary signature. This in here in black, and here in blue is our model for that. And we really refined and refined and refined and refined for about two years until we knew that we could robustly characterize the sample. Okay. Uh, we got about a, three a factor of three improvement on the data quality, and actually Helion has got about another factor of two improvement based on more recent work that I'm not gonna show here. Okay. So once we had that in play, again, that was two years of work, it was actually very quick to run the catalogs through and get a distance measurement through the baryonic acoustical oscillation feature. So my postdoc, Julian, was the one who did that measurement. Because one of the, again, this is one of the main reasons we built the survey, is to make this measurement. Julian found a 2.5% precision measurement using that early sample from the project. And we're going to get better because we're going to take about a factor of three more data uh, from the time that measurement was made. Okay? At the same time, we had this new sample uh, covering a redshift regime between one and two that had never been measured before. Quasars were allowed us to do that. Here is the same measurement in the clustering of quasars. Okay. Again, we see the distinct signature at 100 megaparsec. That's the BAO feature. That case, we can make a distance measurement at 4.4% precision. And that was the first time that ever been done. So that's where we are as of today. Here's the signatures we're looking for, but that's not the final sample. How these compare to the entire field, here's all the distance measurements made in cosmology. It doesn't look, with, with this technique, it doesn't look like that many, but if you look at the y-axis, this is 5% precision up here. So these aren't many, but they're very, very, very precise. Okay. And you also see that our experiments are dominating 60, FS, 60 FGS um, and Wiggle Z are the non-Sloan measurements. The rest is ours. So this is really the way you would statistically characterize our contributions to the field. Uh, what our program officers do when they go out and present it to the particle physicists is they show this figure. Uh, it's actually the same data, bin differently. All of the things in red and all of the things in green are our measurements, and the rest of the world is in blue. So we're doing pretty well. We're also making these measurements in the velocity field, this technique called RSD. You can make the same argument, whereas we dominate the uh, RSD versus redshift curve here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this in too much detail, but I'll just kind of give you a flavor for what the data look like. What you do is you basically compare the signal in a monopole uh, uh, decomposition of the, the correlation function to that of the quadrupole. So you basically, how much is it squashing here in red relative to its overall amplitude in here in blue? And that ratio tells you about the, the velocity field. And it's a very high precision measurement, okay? But the problem is we're only able to measure this. This actually only gives us a 16% constraint because we don't know how to model it very well. And that's the primary limitation here. So we have tons of data, but the, the the understanding of the physics on these scales is not sufficient to, to use the data to their, to, to their statistical power. So that's the measurements we made. What do they really mean about the cosmological model? So we are going to, in the next year, do a full, full bore co uh, cosmology analysis on all the BOSS and EBOSS and the CMB. And we'll be able to say more about this. Here's the results as they were a few years ago. And if you look at the measurements of the CMB plus supernova plus Planck, 
In this typical framework where you're looking at the properties of dark energy, everything remains consistent with a cosmological constant, basically meaning uh, W naught equals minus one, and there's no evolving with redshift. Okay? But we also look for other physics. So one of, the fun of fun, one of the things we looked for were the signature of decaying dark matter in the, in the evolution of, of the growth history. And we don't see any strong ev evidence for de decaying dark matter, but we see funny uh, differences in the models depending on uh, 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 what's assumed. In terms of the number of neutrino species, if you watch the contribution of neutrinos as they go from being relativistic to non-relativistic, um, they, as, as, as the, sorry, as they're acting as a relativistic particle, you expect a very specific contribution to the, um, the matter power spectrum. You expect it to be equivalent to 3.046 species. Uh, our measurements are consistent with that to a decent precision, but not enough to say anything interesting yet. Over here in the neutrino mass, when you couple our measurements with lensing from the cosmic background, you get the best constraints, and that's that 160 elo milli electron volt constraint at 95% confidence. Okay. But no, no detection of mass, just upper limits. Okay. I would say the most interesting thing we're seeing right now that's not explained is uh, a difference in the local Hubble constant when you extrapolate our measurements to, to today. What we do here, the Hubble constant, right, is the velocity of the universe expanding relative to the separation between two points. So you have a velocity that's redshift that's easy to measure. You have a distance in the denominator that's hard to measure. If we take our measurements calibrated by the cosmic background, we see a model that predicts a value of H0 at about 67 kilometers per second with very, very high precision. Right? This is a 1% measurement. That differs by more than three sigma with direct measurements of H0 locally. Now, why is that? When one could say, you know, we're doing something wrong in our measurements, I don't actually believe that. It's very hard to get systematic errors at that scale in our sample. You could say Adam with his supernova and Cepheid variables is doing something wrong. It's possible. He's getting, there's other techniques are finding similar results to his, but at lower significance. Um, you could also say that our calibration of the definition of megaparsec is wrong. So that comes from the, the time that CMB decoupled, and we have a model that says exactly how big the BAU feature should be at that size, at that, scale, at that time, and maybe something in our understanding of early physics is wrong. Maybe there's some other contributions to the expansion history between, redshift, between the Big Bang and between 300,000 years that changes that distance, and that would be very interesting. So if this holds up, this could be a very interesting and surprising measurement. Yeah, so the CMB just tells you what, how many megaparsec are in the BAO feature. And then all you then do is take delta Z in the numerator divided by that scale in the denominator and you get this measurement. So the CMB actually really only, you know, it tells you about the evolution of, of omega matter and, and whatnot. But primarily for this measurement, it's giving us the, the calibration of the standard ruler. And we actually think we can calibrate it independently of the CMB in the future. I won't talk about that, but... That's actually something you can do it with high redshift measurements. So, okay, so we finish the data in about six months, February 15th, we end the, we end the project. We can't do a lot of final measurements until that time happens, but what I've been working on for the last year uh, is to work with everyone in the collaboration and the working groups to really finalize our path forward, okay? The plan is to write all, all these coupled works, these are all coupled to each other, to explain how we get the clustering measurements from galaxies and quasars. And the plan here is these are semi-coupled to each other to make the measurements from Lyman Alpha Forest. We've converged on those. We're gonna get, release all the measurements together at the end of 2019. We're gonna have a press release at AAS in Honolulu uh, to, to release, to announce our data, to announce our final results, and most importantly, to measure the cosmological implications. So that's now where we're going to be looking for the next year plus a few months. So I'll just put up my summary slides. The bottom line is that you know, our, we're finalizing the BOSS and EBOSS samples, and these really will provide unparalleled measurements of the cosmic expansion history uh, over really almost all of cosmic history 
uh, in the next year, and we'll really have those measurements for you shortly. So I can take questions from here. Okay, so the question is, are we going to find anything that provides a smoking gun for inflation? There are people in the world who don't believe in inflation. Um, first of all, I'm not one of these people. I don't see how we live in the universe that we live in without inflation. It's not just the, the, primary, the, the initial conditions of the power spectrum that we see, but it explains things like the lack of the magnetic monopole, it explains uh, the caus you know, causality. It's an excellent, excellent model. Um, we are not... I, the, 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 our measurements have the statistical power to really improve the constraints, but if you buy into basic models, the CMB already give you the smoking gun. Um, they show you the, the, uh, 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 a spectral index less than one. They really, it really works well. And CMB probably with the B mode polarization measurements, if they make those, that will be yet another smoking gun. Although to me, there's already many smoking guns. Um, the problem with our data is that I, this could be a whole talk about how you could do this measurement. The problem is when we go through our selection of objects, uh, it, it imprints structures on all scales that we don't want. And that's because the imaging data are imperfect. So it's really hard to disentangle what we're artificially introducing into our signal from what's the signature of inflation. And that's our primary limitation. And we're, that, we're not able to compete with the CMB because we're not able to beat down that problem in our data. But CMB already gives you smoking guns. Yeah, I didn't talk about how we do it at that level, but we use fiber optics at the location of each galaxy to inject light into the spectrograph. And the question is, why do we use fibers versus anything else? Like, for example, long slits. Uh, the primary reason you use fibers is because you can actually, um, you can, <laughs> so if you have slits, for example, uh, the, the light coming down the slit interferes between one object and another. So you don't get them as high density in, in, in the focal plane. With fibers, I can measure things that overlap in RA and DEC. I don't have to, do, to, to, to separate them along one component. So you get a very much more efficient packing in the focal plane with fibers uh, because the light doesn't interfere. The light gets decoupled and sent down the, into the spectrograph independently. That's really the primary reason. Um, there's people who say that size sky subtraction is harder with fibers, but I actually think it's easier. Um, I, I found when I used to work in slit spectroscopy that you couldn't get uh, uh, crud on the edge of the slits out from the sky models, and it is, I, I always had more residuals than we do in our, in our fiber spectra. spectra. Um, but the primary reason is you can more efficiently get fibers on the sky than you can slits. If I were to write a paper, I wouldn't expect 150 people to read it. And if you have 150 co-authors, or 500 or something like that. Is there anybody else in the universe that's reading your papers? <laughs> so, okay, so technically, you know, when you go into a journal, you're, you know, if you're an author, you're required to have read the paper. But I'm gonna first answer that question by saying that of those 150 people, only a small fraction have read it. Have read it page to page, you know, and cover to cover. Um, that's a bad confession. I sh we, should cut the, we should cut the video. Um, so that's technically violating publication policies. Um, but the, the, our, you know, we are a pretty, we're our own collaboration. There's other collaborations of similar scale, like, they're, like some, so they run a project in, uh, in Australia. There's the Cosmic Background Community. What they typically do is they, they kind of know the idea of what we're doing, and they look for the information they want. But our papers have some overlap from paper to paper to paper as well. I would say most. Oh, I would not say 100%. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Uh, I would say I have, I have definitely seen and, and, and know all the content of everything, uh, but that's pretty time consuming. Yeah, so noise comes in many different ways. Uh, there's Poisson noise, you know, how, how finely you're sampling the density field. So if you don't, if you, if you have these, you're basically trying to measure the underlying modes that are like this on the sky. But if you sample them really finely, you get all the information out. But if you only have enough gal galaxies to sample sporadically, you lose information. So that's one source. So it's basically the noise goes with what's the number density of objects that we put into the, our, our spectrograph. And then another source of noise is that if I take a snapshot of the universe, it's noisy itself. So this density field is a little bit different from this density field, which is a little different from this density field. So the bigger the volume I explore, the more I beat down the noise. So it's really a game on those two parameters. How much volume are you getting and how many objects are you using to probe that volume? Is that, is that, okay, okay. How long do you average typically when you have one fiber connected to your uh, spectrograph, basically? So we, we have, a th in the current design, we have a thousand fibers that go simultaneously. And again, that's, the, that's back to the question of why fibers. Um, so we get a thousand spectrum at a, spectrum at a time, and we typically integrate for about an hour. And in the best month we ever had, we did over 100 plates of a thousand fibers each. So in the best month we ever had, we got about 100,000 spectra. And over the course of 10 years, we've gotten about 3.5 million spectra. In DESI, it's going to be an order of magnitude bigger. So you can kind of imagine what the next generation is going to look like. And the reason it's going to be bigger is we're going to have 5,000 fibers instead of 1,000, and we're going to have three times the collecting area. So bigger, a bit, we're going to collect photons more quickly. Okay. Just remind them how big the field of view is for the 1,000 fibers. Yeah, so the field of view is three degrees across in diameter. So it's about six moon, you can stack six full moons across our field of view. And we patchwork the sky, right? We do, we literally tile it like you would tile the floor, and we call them tiles for that reason. And we tile it with these circular fields over the whole sky, and, and it takes about, in, our, in BOSS it took, five, it took uh, 2,000 tiles to cover 10,000 square degrees. And 10,000 square degrees is basically all you can observe from the northern hemisphere. That's outside the galaxy. That's, that's actually, it's extra galactic. Okay, maybe, I don't know, one, one more and then we can call it a day. <laughs> I don't know, you showed pictures in your talk, uh, Frontiers, of people putting the fibers in place. Yeah, I love that video. Every time you, you have a specific tile, you have to reorganize, reorganize all those fibers. Every tile literally has a distinct aluminum plate. Oh. Okay. So we've drilled. We drill them in, in, in Washington, and we mail them to, to New Mexico you know, in batches of 10. And they show up, and they, they, our observers say, OK, tonight we want these eight fields. And a staff goes in, and they plug in fibers like this. And you know, when I talk about the operations, like Vivek kind of helps set up that pipeline to work out the communications between the observers and the daytime staff. We all, I know all the daytime staff, and, and I, I plug things myself. I know the observers and how they interact. So that's a large part of running this type of experiment, is how those, uh, those moving pieces go through. And it actually, it actually is a lot of time to make sure it goes through correctly. You guys trust the USPS? <laughs> <laughs> We've actually just recently changed to, to our shipping. <laughs> <It's> not, <laughs> and that, kind of, that pissed me off, by the way. It caused me great headache. <laughs> I, I, and then I, 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 I made all kinds of mistakes, and I pissed everyone off downstream, and it, it was a problem when they changed it. <laughs> I, I, okay. Right, yeah, come, I'll, I'll talk to you in person. <laughs>